Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker Series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, we are pleased to be here at the Tinkham Veal University Center on the campus of Case Western Reserve University to hear Dr. Nicole Burt speak on A Fine Kettle of Fish, Reconstructing Neanderthal Diet. Dr. Burt received her PhD from the University of Alberta and followed that with a fellowship at Harvard University's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. She is currently postdoctoral fellow in human health and evolutionary medicine at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Burt. Thanks for joining me for the uh, last Neanderthal talk of the season here. So, we're gonna start by talking a little bit about who the Neanderthals are. I know a lot of you have been to other of these talks, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're gonna start with that. Then we're gonna talk about the uh, methods of reconstructing diet and health. Um, and that's important because this is all very scientifically based. So to, to evaluate the science, you need to know how, how it's done. Then we're going to go into why diet matters. Diet's about more than just what people ate. It's about how they lived. So we're gonna talk about that. And then we're going to go into the specifics of Neanderthal diet. I know you all probably think it's meat and that we're done, right? Um, but we're gonna talk about it in some more depth than that. And then we're going to go into how things like diet and subsistence may have played a part in Neanderthal extinction or not. And then we're gonna unpack kind of our baggage about Neanderthal diet and its relationship to modern humans and human diet. So who are the Neanderthals? So they got some nice pictures there. They lived from about 350,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago. They do auto, uh, overlap with modern humans. So we are going to um, talk about a cousin that actually uh, lived in some of the same places and same time periods as us. So it's a little bit different than talking about some other hominids in our family tree. The territory for Neanderthals is actually quite vast. We always think about classic Neanderthals are in Europe, right? If most people, that's where they think of Neanderthals. They were also present in the Middle East as well as um, Asia. And that also, so the, the time frame um, over time, they would contract. So the range began to shrink down in the later stages. So that's something to um, pay attention to. And there is a variety of sites um, across Europe and the Middle East for that. We're only gonna talk about a few sites in any real specific detail, so don't worry about that. But an idea of how widespread the Neanderthals were. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what's different about Neanderthals when compared to a modern human. So when you look at these pictures, from a nice lateral view, you can see from their, their, their profile here. Um, the humans have a big ball-shaped head, right? We have very vertical uh, vault, nice round head. Um, our face is set low to our heads. So we have a forehead that's quite uh, broad. And we have a chin, which you can see really well in this um, view that projects forward. The Neanderthal, on the other hand, has a football-shaped head compared to us, right? So they have heavy brow ridges and an occipital bun, which is that bump in the back of his skull. Um, and they have, in general, more robust features than us. Um, you'll also notice there is not a chin. His face recedes a little bit in comparison to the uh, modern human. And you'll notice the retromolar space. That's just the space behind the molars. Um, and it looks like he could get a couple fingers behind those molars in the side of his jaw there. So those are some distinctive characteristics when looking at uh, Neanderthals and modern humans. So you can tell that they are different species. Front view, again, you can see the overall difference with the chin and the forehead. Um, but one of the big things in this view is you can see how open the Neanderthal's navel cavity is. So he has a big open um, um, nose, so big nose, primarily, bigger than ours. Um, and for their overall body plan, and these are 
adjusted to be the same size in general. You can see that the Neanderthal's whole body is quite robust, not just its skull, that's about muscle attachments. So it, it helps you recreate their stronger, more active lifestyle. They often have signs of um, pathology, which you've probably heard in the previous talks. So um, you also notice in this, hopefully, that the Neanderthal pelvis is a little bit more flared than ours, a little bit bigger and wider. Um, and they have some foreshortening in their forelimbs, so in the, their um, lower arm, in their lower leg. Um, a lot of that is associated with cold adaptions, so that's a lot of why it's theorized that those body proportions are a little bit different. Um, and that also extends to the rib cage, where you see the Neanderthal has a flared rib cage, and we have that nice upright, tight rib cage. Okay, so there's overall body plan, a little bit of difference, but on a whole, they look very similar. And why is that important? Um, if you saw Scott's talk, which hopefully you did, he talked about kissing cousins and how um, Neanderthal DNA survives on in modern humans. So uh, modern humans have between one and 4% of Neanderthal DNA. If you are in um, Europe or in parts of um, Asia, that would be true. Um, and what's interesting about this is that even though Neanderthals and Homo sapiens developed, um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say they're separate species, so now I'm on record. So they developed a special, se uh, separate species in different areas, they never diverged so far that they were incapable of interbreeding. So once they lived in the same place at the same time, which happened in Europe about 30,000 years ago, they were able to share their genetic um, material with each other. Um, which is very interesting when we're studying these things about extinction. So the idea, a lot of um, common ideas about why we are here and Neanderthals aren't, revolve around competitive extinction and the idea that modern humans um, were better, right? So for somebody to survive and someone else not to, someone has to be better. So the modern humans have a technological advantage that was talked about a lot in the previous talks. And um, the Neanderthals were lacking in things like um, culture, symbolism, and adaptability. That adaptability is a big part of what we're gonna talk about tonight as an important factor when we're studying subsistence patterns, which is what you eat, okay? So how you eat matters for how your body is built and your ability to survive. So we're gonna talk about that in more detail about whether or not um, Neanderthals are failing um, to adapt to their environment in such a way that it might lead to their extinction. And to justify why these theories exist, we're gonna talk a little bit about why diet and health are so important to understanding things like your ability to survive. So we all know that we have dietary recommendations now. This is the eat well plate, which is the current, this replaced the food pyramid. Okay, so this is what the government tells you about how to eat now. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that we know that diet is important to health. There's no question about that. But we're constantly updating our ideas about what a good diet is, right? So this is the current version. And you can see there's a lot of vegetables, there's a lot of grain, there's also a lot of dairy products. That's the blue bar. We're gonna talk about how that's really interesting, that big blue bar, considering not all humans can drink dairy. Um, and then a, a smaller proportion of meat. So this is very different than what we think of about with Neanderthal diets, right? If I asked you what Neanderthals eat, you'd all yell meat at me, right? It would just be, don't do it, but that's what would happen. <laughs> and so we have an idea that this is a good diet, this is the balanced diet, so it's the right diet for us, so it must be the ideal that Neanderthals must fit or they're somehow ill-suited for their environment if they're not doing this, okay? So keep that in your head, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. But how this actually works then is that diverse diets lead to diverse nutrition, which equal less mortality. And we know this in human studies, they can study this clinically. Okay, and that diversity in diet needs to be both in macro and micronutrients. That means you need enough vitamins and minerals in your diet, but you also need a diversity of things like water, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. You do need fats. You cannot cut out fat from your diet, just to clarify 
eat some fat. It's good for you. Um, so how those things go together is what we're talking about. This is particularly important in an evolutionary context because diet and nutrition become the key factor in healthy infants, okay? So to, to last, to survive to the present, we all must be able to reproduce. So if this fails because you don't have the right diet or the right access to food, you're done, okay? So that diet um, being good, which is, you notice I'm not giving you a lot of specifics. That's because there's a lot that goes into this. So this is a lot of what we're trying to figure out with medicine right now, okay? So we know that pregnancy outcomes, like to carry a baby to term, the mother needs proper neonatal care. She needs a proper nutrition and diet. We know that you have increased um, um, developmental defects in fetuses if they are not, um, if the mother doesn't have the right diet, the, the baby can't form process properly which of course will affect both um, the ability to have enough children, but also the life of the child that is born, okay? So a restricted diet of a mother will affect how long that child will live, okay? So your mother's health during pregnancy affects your mortality rate or profile, like your ability um, your health profile with that, okay? So these are really real things that affect your life in an ongoing manner. And this is true of all animals, including humans. Hmm? Advance, okay. So the thing about, uh, that's really key in this discussion as well, is that we know that um, dietary differences within human populations lead to differential reproduction of human groups. So if you look at a human group that doesn't get enough to eat, they will not be as um, reproductively successful as a group that's really affluent. They will not have as many surviving children, so we know this. So the idea is that these low diversity uh, Neanderthal diets would result in Neanderthals having greater infant mortality than modern humans that we're coming into contact with. So they would have lower populations, right? So the Neanderthals, we know they're living in small groups, but the idea is that um, they would, there would be a cap on their ability to sustain a larger population. So they cannot spread the way modern humans can. Think of it like um, when rabbits were introduced in Australia, okay? So they get there, it's a really good niche, there's lots of food, they proliferate really fast. We have the compounding um, um, factor of climate change. So that lack of dietary diversity may not be a big problem when all the foods you're used to eating exist. But if you cannot adapt to a new environment, you're going to be outcompeted or your environment will just go away. Think of the koalas, right? They eat eucalyptus, there's no eucalyptus, they're done. So if Neanderthals only eat mammoths and there are no mammoths, Neanderthals are done if they cannot figure out what else to eat. This is kind of the ba background to these kind of ecological arguments about the die out of Neanderthals. So these are really important ideas about are Neanderthals able to adapt to climate change the way modern humans can? And at this point, we're coming out of a glacial period, period, so it's warming, okay? So foods are changing, animal migration patterns are changing, a lot is changing with the environment. So we don't just want to do this um, with you know, we can, we can talk about it just generally, you know, what do they eat? Meat, yay, done. Um, but that's not, um, that's not what I do. So my particular research is on um, reconstructing diet using stable isotope analysis. We're gonna talk a little bit about how that works because I know from experience that um, people have a problem with it. So stable isotopes um, are the ratio of a heavy to a light isotope and they're presented to you as delta values. So the difference between the amount of a heavy isotope and a light isotope. Isotopes are stable in this context. That means they have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons, so they don't decay. These, don't, these aren't carbon-14. Um, and the main thing is you are what you eat. So you eat the carbon and nitrogen, and then you make it into your body, okay? 
So you have different carbon sources that you can detect with those delta values. So C3 plants and C4 plants have different photosynthetic pathways. C3 plants are temperate plants, things like wheat and oats. People who live in Europe eat a lot of C3 plants, okay? C4 plants are things like sugarcane and maize and millet. They're tropical plants, okay? So you can tell the types of uh, plants being used. Well, I, I think I understand you to say that Neanderthals and modern humans were living at the same time in the same... In the same way, I mean, at, at some time, they were, they, at some times, they were living at the same time. And they were living in similar areas. Um, if, if we're, if we're going to go, if we're going to say that they had different diets and that somehow affected uh, their longevity as a species, why weren't they just all eating the same thing? That's exactly the question. So the idea is, and we'll get into this when we recur. Uh, recreate the Neanderthal diet is a lot of the early ways we had of reconstructing diet are biased towards meat. So a lot of the evidence we have was just meat, meat, meat. And so that's what people saw, that's what people assumed. We are modern humans, so we know that we tend to eat other foods, so there, it's easier to imagine diversity there without necessarily having as much science to back it up. So we're going to get into that, but the, the, that question is, why are Neanderthals not adaptable enough to exploit their whole environment? That's, that's exactly the question we're going to ask answer by the end. So we will answer that. If you go back one slide to the um, definitions of the deltas. Um, no, that's two slides. There you go. Uh, I noticed that you have a uh, minus sign in front of them, minus 26 per mil and minus 12 per mil. Uh, what's the significance of the minus sign? Could you, could you, could you say how you calculate it? I was going to gloss, gloss over it, but it's, um, you can only do ratios in reference to a standard, and our standards are much more positive than anything found in animals. And so when we recreate these, they're always negative, because this, this, this is the difference between the standard. It's just the effect of the standard they chose. We do stable isotope. It's um, for carbon. It's PD belamite is the standard, and it's arbitrary. There's no reason that has to be the standard. That's just the global standard, and so we're stuck with negative numbers. So <laughs> that's, that's the short answer, is that that was an unfortunate, they, when they didn't know as much about it, they picked an unfortunate standard. Um, so but really, whenever we're doing this, this is a good point. In isotopes, it's always their relationship to each other. The numbers themselves don't really matter. We're going to graph them, and it's about understanding the relationships of where they fall on a plane. So we'll get to that. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Nicole Burt discussing the scientific methods for reconstructing the diets of ancient animals, including human ancestors. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Burt will describe the diet of our Neanderthal cousins. Now, back to the talk. That's what the carbon is used for get our heads back in the game. So with nitrogen, um, and I think I glazed over this, but when we're recreating these diets using the isotopes, the primary source of them is dietary proteins. So if you're eating all plants, that'll be plants, but most omnivores, which humans are, um, eat a mix of plant and meat. So it will prioritize um, the protein portions of your diet. So if there's this animal protein, it will be preferentially shown in the isotopes. Um, and the reason for that is that tissues are enriched compared to dietary protein, uh, protein based on how your body processes nitrogen, how all bodies process nitrogen. So every time the nitrogen that is ingested is processed, it will be enriched, that means it goes up, by three to five per mil. Per mil is just the... Um, measurement of the ratio for the delta values here, okay? So don't, it's the number. So we just want how it works. So uh, plants make nitrogen. Then they're the producers. So they have a base level of nitrogen. And then we're gonna eat that. So the, the herbivores eat a plant. So they are raised above their food source by three to five per mil on average. Different animals, a little bit different. 
than a hawk eats a mouse. It is raised three to five per mil above the mouse because it ate it, okay? So it's, a, it's a, a chain, right? So the numbers just get higher and higher and higher depending on how carnivorous the chain is. So fish have really high chains because fish like to eat other fish, okay? So we're gonna look at this on a graph. So this is from some of my work in medieval Britain. The humans are the triangle and the square. So they're omnivores, so they're in the center. The, the little animals are all uh, recreated. These are um, the isotopes from bones found in um, Britain to, to, to balance it out. So the herbivore, the cow, is the lowest value. The fish is the highest value, right? Because they're gonna be carnivores. All the omnivores, pigs are omnivores, dogs are omnivores, humans are omnivores, are somewhere in the middle, okay? Now you see something really interesting here, and I want you to keep this in mind. The two human groups that I have here, the square is actually an urban group, and they eat a lot more fish than the triangle group. The triangle group is rural and they eat a lot more cow. And so then you have a big difference in their nitrogen value. So even among humans, you'll get these big differences in how much nitrogen they're eating. You'll also notice almost everybody is a, somewhere around negative 21 in carbon, carbon being the horizontal bar, except for those fish, which are really po um, positive. Really positive values in carbon. If you don't have sugar, which they don't, they haven't got, they haven't had the benefit of sugar cane yet. They're not like us. So that means marine fish, okay? Because the carbon for ocean habitats is different than the carbon coming from terrestrial habitats. So we can find, if people are using um, marine fish or mollusks, we can see that really clearly in the isotopes, okay? So this is how we're gonna do some reconstructions when we look at Neanderthals. So you don't actually have to know about medieval Britain, but I like it. That was the questions that we did already. So then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, zooarchaeology, which is the study of archeological bones, okay? Particularly animal bones. So I'm a biological anthropologist, I study human bones, these people study animal bones. And they use the bones um, and the preservation of those bones to understand the faunal assemblages. That is, so when they're digging up the site, they find some set of animals in that site. So they have to understand why those animals are there. Is it natural or man-made? So if they're lucky enough and they have cut marks, that's clearly man-made. Man put a cut mark on it, right? However, you can also look at things like which parts of the animal are there. Humans will select um, pieces of an animal that have more meat on them. So you'll often find, say, a lot of um, shanks, like upper thighs, meaty parts in a human settlement, whereas if you just have a washout zone, so there's a flood and it carries all the bones from an area into um, a, a cave or something to collect, um, it'll sort them by weight, okay? So you get a very different distribution if humans are moving things than if they're just washing away, okay? So there's a science to this as well. And this is done in conjunction with um, lithic analysis, which is the fancy way to stay studying stone tools Okay, so you can look at both use wear and residue. And you wouldn't think there'd be residue on stone tools from Neanderthals, but there is, we'll get to it. Okay, so there's actually, you know, they didn't clean their knives very well, there's stuff still on it, okay? You'll also get the use wear from that, so the different things you hit with your tool leave a different mark. Okay, so actually uh, archeologists do a lot of experimental archeology span on this. So they make their own st stone tools and like cut different stuff to see what happens and they look at it under a microscope. So it's really fun. So that's gonna to apply to this as well. Um, all of those methods obviously, like the isotopes is direct at studying the body. Um, but these are some more direct evidence you can get of diet, diet. that's copper, coprolite analysis which is obviously the study of preserved feces. I'm sure we all know what coprolite means. Um, and what we're studying in there is the, the sterols and the stanols, which are, a chem don't worry about it, they're chemicals produced by plants, okay? So when you do the spectral analysis of the coprolite, you can see that they're using plants. So this is a big thing for actually getting 
um, reconstructing plant use. However, you have to be lucky, lucky enough to find a latrine, which is hard to find. Um, you can also do dental wear, and that's by microware. So when you eat things, it chips off your enamel. So you, they look at the striation in the teeth, just like they would on the lithics, but it's with a tooth. And then you also get um, the, uh, the microfossils. So you get little starch grains or bacteria or phytoliths, which are little parts of plants actually stuck in the calculus. Does everyone know what calculus is? So if you go to the dentist, they scrape off the plaque. If they don't, it turns into a rock and we can study that, okay? So that's, it's, this is an extreme case, but it's pretty common in archeological remains. So you see, uh, um, you know, it's a good way to recreate diet because we know that they, chew, they at least chewed it up. We don't, well, I guess we don't know they swallowed it, but they probably did. Um, so now we get into the nitty gritty here, okay? So we have a lot of animal bones and artifacts from Neanderthal sites. They come, they're, they're almost always a monolithic species, so each spite, uh, site is dominated by one type of animal. For instance, in the site this comes from, you have 71% red deer, okay? So a lot of the remains will be from one specific type of animal. They are almost all terrestrial herbivores, so they're deer, they're aurochs, they're bison, they're mammoths, um, horses, they're herbivores. That matters to when we do the, the isotope analysis. And um, they're seasonally exploited. So they're clearly paying attention to like the migration patterns of the animals and taking the animals that are around for the season that they're hunting. So we have the bones. So this is why when you see Neanderthals meet, this is a lot of what that is about. We also find tools with a lot of wear on them which clearly indicate that they were hunting and butchering animals. These are some bones with some cut marks on them. Cut marks are not that exciting. It, it seems really, it sounds exciting, but it's, it looks stripes on bone. Um, so we know that they were processing the meat themselves and eating it. And then we have these uh, nitrogen ratios, which show uh, the Neanderthals in this are the black square with the gray in it. So they're the top point on all four graphs there. All four graphs are different sites compared. And what they have in common is that there's a really tight Neanderthal diet and it's the same regardless of um, the type of environment they think the sites would have. So if they're an open or a forested place, they're almost always um, the same nitrogen level, which implies a high dependence on terrestrial herbivores just like all those bones that we found. Um, in fact, a lot of the early reconstruction said they look more like carnivore nitrogen values, and that's complicated for a number of reasons, um, which we're gonna get to, um, partially about how you interpret Neanderthal values. Um, and the Neanderthals in general have much less variation than found in humans. So when you look at different human sites and you touch, cite their um, stable isotopes, they have a lot more difference depending on where they're living. Okay, so they seem to be much more uh, reactive to their environment and their food choices. All right? We'll get to why that's important in a second. But when you start looking more closely at these remains, you start to see a slightly different story about diet. So when you're, our, our ability to analyze lithics has improved, we're starting to see as well as our recovery of sites. So when we excavate now, we spend more time getting the little bones out. So we know that um, Neanderthals were eating small mammals and birds. We know this from things like this lithic, which has a barb, a barb, like a little piece of feather stuck in it, okay? So it got wedged in there and you can identify that with isotopic, isotopic analysis. And this is just a Neanderthal site. It's not, uh, it's not a human site. So what that means is small game is really interesting in that um, it often takes um, um, a lot more planning and um, technology. So they have the technology and the planning to do small game hunting as well as to do these big hunts for things like mammoths. Um, they're showing the cognitive ability to plan it as well as there's evidence from how these bones are cached and there's seasonality that they are storing supplies for the future. So they know that they maybe will need it in the future and are taking precautions to have food um, at a later date. 
Um, and then there's a general organization to the sites that is not at the level of modern humans, but it does show that they're taking at least some care in what they're doing. Um, there's some sort of planning, not necessarily, again, at the level that we see in modern humans, but they're, they're, they're doing something with, with their site. They're not just, you know, I can only think of horrible things to say, so I'm not going to say them. So the pros of an all-meat diet are game meat is very low fat and lean, which is good for you, keeps your cholesterol low, good for your heart. It's a good source of micronutrients such as iron, zinc, and vitamin B12. So you get some micronutrients by eating meat. That's good. Um, however, however, there's also some cons of eating an all meat diet or game meat diet. You need to eat a lot more meat to maintain your metabolic function. On average, you need 9 to 18% more meat calories um, to sustain your caloric intake than if you were just eating a more diverse diet, fats, et cetera. Um, the diet, as proposed, would be deficient in fat and carbs. But you're like, wait, they're eating meat. How can it be deficient in fat? Um, game meats are very, very low fat. So unless they're eating um, fatty organs, internal organs, or a lot of bone marrow, they would not be getting um, enough fat from just that alone. The small game, on the other hand, is fattier, as are fish, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so there are other sources of fat that you could incorporate into your diet. When you're eating a you know, majority meat diet, you're also lacking vitamins A, C, and E, um, which is a big problem. So can you eat meat alone? And when people reconstruct the energy requirements of a Neanderthal, they have, they, it varies. But generally, it's recreated at something like 5,500 uh, 5, calories per day. So higher than a human's in a modern context, not necessarily higher than an active human. Um, calorie intake, uh, intake is very hard to calculate. Um, but to get 5,500 5, calories from meat alone, you would have to eat over 65% of your diet um, would need to be meat, so to get the, the right calories. Um, and that's just, we'll get into it, but that's really difficult to sustain. So you need other animal and plant foods to do that. So medical conditions that you might get, things like protein toxicity, vitamin A toxicity, which would ruin your kidneys and your liver, and pregnant women just can't survive with that. So you need to eat the salad, right? So you have things like residue from the starches, which can be used for food and woodworking. There's possible grinding stones from the sites that indicate salad. This is that um, fecal analysis that we talked about, um, which show that there is significant and unambiguous inclusion of plant materials in the feces of Neanderthals. They're still predominantly eating meat, but they are eating plants. So we'll get into what does balance mean in a second. So there's a wide spectrum of plants, things like grass, dates, legumes, that's beans, plant bulbs, uh, unidentified, and that really does indicate that they're cooking the food. So there's cracking of those seeds, um, which is interesting as well as a technological advancement. Um, in El Cedrone, the calculus analysis confirms the evidence of cooking. The seeds that we have found in the calculus have evidence of cooking on them from the mouths of Neanderthals, which is very interesting. Um, there's a wide range of um, stuff found in the calculus, which again is double, double finding. And we're going to talk more about the use of that bitter tasting appetite suppressants in a minute. But they found non-food related plant material. So keep that in your brain. And then we also have a lot of evidence for fish. Um, and that's something that was really thought to be a human thing. So you can see that both in the, uh, m the damage on the stone tools, as well as um, so we have stone, as well as uh, actual remains of fish and mollusks, which we find in places um, as early as 500,000 years ago in the Spanish Neanderthals along the coast, and they show uh, continual use of these uh, fish remains and burn marks. 
your slide that showed the uh, variety of animals that were eaten, the large number of red deer almost suggests that they were herded rather than hunted, or at least hunted in a much more efficient manner. And the, the small number of things like lions and mammoths might indicate that they weren't hunted, but maybe scavenged or, you know, uh, what, what's the general pattern for how they obtained those uh, animals? We do know that they were using spears to hunt. Um, there are, I'm not primarily a zooarchaeologist, like I said, um, but I do know there is some signs of, particularly in modern humans, that they are definitely like corralling them, they're like corralling them to hunt them. Um, so there is different ways of hunting and scavenging is always an option and there's nothing wrong with scavenging, totally a legit way to get your food. So it is possible that they are also scavenging. Um, so you could tell that based on um, some of the, the bone kill sites. So they do have kill sites as well as habitation. I'm focusing mainly on um, what they're doing with the food than how they're gathering it. But yes, there's definitely could be scavenging happening as well as actual active hunting. You seem to be assuming that the metabolism of these people is the same as our metabolism now. And is uh, any evidence that that's true? You're also assuming that our metabolism then is the same as our metabolism now. There's a lot of assumptions about uh, happening in these reconstructions. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions being made. And those metabolism questions, I, I presented it to you unproblematically uh, uh, un un to make this talk flow. But yes, there's a lot of problems in, in how we're calculating that. We do know that generally primates, which they are a primate hominids, need certain things to survive. So at a basic level, knowing they're going to need the, the micro and macronutrients, we know that. When we're doing things like how many calories exactly they need, that is, that is some fuzzy math. So you're absolutely right, but... I had two questions. One of them you answered in part already um, about scavenging. I, I think that if you're going to draw conclusions from the fact that these are hunters, you have to prove that they weren't scavenging. Uh, things like uh, organization skills and uh, you know various conclusions that come from a hunting society uh, really assume that they were hunting rather than scavenging. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask you, though, uh, more importantly, you mentioned that there's an upper limit on the amount of meat that can be in a diet and still lead to healthy offspring and so on. And I'd like you to consider the case of uh, relatively modern Eskimos uh, who are basically on a completely meat diet. Uh, what makes them different? Uh, Eskimos are not on a completely meat diet. Humans have different balanced diets, but they do eat some um, plant material. and like. A lot of that is from, again, I'm forgetting, um, the Eskimo actually have a word for it, but they'll actually eat the stomach contents of herbivores, which have already processed the grass down so they can eat it. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to get plant materials that's not eating plant materials you can't access. They also utilize things like seaweed and seasonally. So all of this is averaged over time. So just because you can't eat vegetables during the whole year, as long as you're never going into such a deficit that it kills you, um, it's okay to be a little bit deficient for a while and then catch up. So it, it can be seasonal access. So there can be limited access. So that's one of the things we've actually learned from um, that. And then um, on the scavenging aspect, I would just say that scavenging also takes a lot of brain power. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Nicole Burt. Before joining the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, Dr. Burt was with Harvard University's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. In the second part of our talk, we learned what Neanderthals ate. In our final segment, Dr. Burt will discuss where all the Neanderthals went. Now, back to our talk. Okay, so moving on to burn marks and cut marks. So we know that there is evidence of Neanderthals eating fish previously to humans coming in and showing them how to fish. Um, I haven't been stressing that a lot here, but often anytime there's any proof of a Neanderthal doing something around the time humans show up, it's, well, they looked at the human and they figured it out. Um, 
much like how they used to think uh, other primates were learning tool use from the people studying them before they realized that chimps really were um, doing a lot of these behaviors on their own. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so humans, sorry, see we gotta get to the fish puns. Um, Humans do utilize um, fish quite early in the history. Um, we have good evidence for this. And as I mentioned, it was often considered a human only advantage because you have to actually go to either a river or the marine um, coast. You have to think about when the tide's out, you have to go collect the shells out and then bring them back and process them. You gotta break them open. You can't just eat it on the go. Um, so it is a complex process, eating mollusks. So this does show a level of planning in your food resources. Um, that's important. See, I was almost there, so close. Okay, so beyond diet, um, we have a lot of evidence for um, current primates other than humans using medicinal plants, um, both uh, as painkillers and as diet uh, appetite suppressors. Um, so there's not enough food so you're eating so that you don't feel as hungry. And those compounds that we saw in the calculus that I told you to keep in your brain um, are actually yarrow and chamomile, which are bitter. You, don't, you wouldn't just eat them because they taste good. Um, and they do suppress appetite. So it might show that the Neanderthals are trying to utilize plants not just as a dietary source, but also in a medicinal purpose. Um, we also have uh, birds being used not just for diet, excuse me, <clears throat> So not just for diet, but for possibly for decoration. Um, and again, this behavior precedes the arrival of modern humans. And I will point this out to you. So if you look at um, the, the C diagram, I think that actually might be E, the bottom, the bottom middle diagram, you'll, you'll see that there's a dot and then some scratch marks next to it. That dot is where a wing feather would attach to the bone of a bird. Okay, so those cut marks near it, near it mean that they're pulling the wing feathers out. Okay, now you might go like, that just means they're processing a bird to eat it. That part of a bird does not need to be, you wouldn't eat it. There's no, nothing delicious there. And the birds that these wing feathers are pulled out of are actually uh, raptors and corvids, which are crows and things like hawks. So they're not really, I mean, you could eat it, but it's not gonna taste very good. Um, it's, not, it's not a cute little songbird with a big soft breast that you can eat. Um, so it's, it's a, a fair sim sign that maybe uh, we have something um, symbolic happening or decoration happening among Neanderthals um, with how they're processing their food. So they're selecting things not just to eat, but also for other cultural activities. And we get to the fun part that I know you're all waiting for. Um, so, Cannibalism, and this is not in the diet section on purpose because even though there are clear signs of cannibalism at uh, Krafina and uh, Mulagersi, they are not primarily cannibals. You cannot survive with your main meat source being the others of your kind and not just wipe out your population. So that is, they are not primary cannibals, it does happen. And we can see that by how the bone is processed. It's po processed just like the red deer at this site, and there, there's a lot of cut marks, so it's, it's clear. However, we need to step back from our cultural taboos about cannibalism. So we tend to think about cannibalism in forms of like, uh, being a brutal and savage, to be very um, um, just taboo in general, and you can only think of like survival cannibalism. What we're talking about is not survival cannibalism. They weren't starving and therefore eat, ate Neanderthals. And this is also common, common for something as taboo as cannibalism in human populations as well as other animals, okay? So we're talking about cannibalism as a cultural practice. So it can be endo, which means you are cannibalizing people within your group. This tends to be funeral rites. Um, so it's a respect to the dead type of thing. Or exocannibalism, which is usually associated with warfare. There, isn't, there is not really signs of warfare at the sites that we're talking about with Neanderthals being cannibalized. So does that mean that they're practicing funeral rites? 
that's beyond what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, but there is always something more in human societies about this. And in case you didn't believe me, there are over 1,500 animal species that are known to be cannibalistic at times, not always. Again, nothing can survive only on its own kind. Um, it also increases your dis disease risk. So there's a lot of real problems with that. Um, and then there's human cases, and these go from um, prehistory all the way up to the 60s and 70s, they have cases of this. But they're not, again, to us it seems really like that has to be from a hateful, bad place, but um, there's a lot more that goes into it. So I will say that Neanderthals do have cannibalism, but we should not necessarily judge them too harshly for that because we are also cannibals. Um, not us personally in this room, I assume. Um, so is the Neanderthal diet, uh, diet balanced, right? What does balance mean? I said that a balanced diet leads to good health. We know that they're omnivores and they're probably hunter-gatherers, much like the humans at the same time. They're getting food from multiple food sources. It is not the same as our modern food pyramid. It's still very, very meat heavy. Okay, so even though I've shown you they're eating plants, they have a very meat heavy diet, okay? More meat heavy than the humans near them. But what does that mean? When we look at a balanced diet again, do the modern humans at 3,000 years ago have a balanced diet that looks like our diet? Probably not. For one, they can't drink milk. We'll get into that in a second. But they can't drink milk, so that's not on there. They can eat plant materials, so they are gonna have grains. Um, they're possibly eating um, some amount of fish. They do seem, based on the isotopes, to have more dietary breaths than the Neanderthals. That means they're exploring more types of food than the Neanderthals. But does that necessarily matter? If you're hitting all your bases, even if you're eating three vegetables, three vegetables is better than no vegetables. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, and of course, we have more plants recovered from those sites. So we actually know more about the human diet. So it's easy to say that it's better because we, we know more about it. Um, so one of the things we have to disentangle these type of arguments from is thinking that early human diet has to be our diet, our Western diet, which is very specific for our time and place. Diets are always specific to the time and the place of the people eating them, okay? So there is no idyllic past where for once brief moment, what we ate and what we needed to eat were the same. That doesn't exist, okay? So we are constantly changing our diet and we're constantly evolving, okay? So it's all about, um, you, know, you know, moderation. Don't eat too much of any one thing and you know, change, eat what you can eat to survive. That becomes very important. Um, so we have good evidence of grains being utilized 30,000 years ago, even though we are not agriculturalists yet. Um, and we know that lactose tolerance, which is the weird part, the mutation is tolerance. Most adult mammals, including humans, cannot drink milk, okay? So lactose tolerance is only about 10,000 years old. Mutation for that, oops, sorry. I forgot about the mic for a second. Um, but you can see those blue spots. Those are lactose spots, okay? So in different human populations where being able to drink milk gave a selected advantage, we developed the ability to drink, like it, it proliferated within our societies. So random mutation took off because it helps us survive. I can eat milk and I am from Wisconsin, so I will continue to eat milk. But if you cannot eat milk, well, that's very sad for you, you're fine, okay? So that's normal. Now that that's done, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Neanderthals being outcompeted, okay? So we know that Neanderthal decline coincides with the arrival of humans. Does that mean humans caused it? You'll notice when you read, if you read the literature, you notice it tends to be very um, antagonistic. Um, and we also, at the time that humans are moving into Europe, we have the decline of the mammoths and the dung beetles. I don't think humans outcompeted dung beetles, okay? So there is additional things happening. Are they in direct competition? They might be. 
I mean, we don't have signs of them trying to live in the same spot at the same time. And we do know they exploit similar resources, but maybe it was a problem. We do know that humans were living, um, were likely living in larger population groups than were the Neanderthals, which may have given them the edge that they need. Um, we're learning really interesting things about the effect of climate change on um, the survival ship of these, of these um, Pleistocene animals, such as mammoths, um, which survived at Regal Island for quite a long time to 1700 BC. Um, and what's interesting about that is it's hot by that time, hot for a mammoth. And they're surviving, right? They're managing to find a niche that works. However, um, it seems that they were killed out. Their population had enough genetic diversity to it. It was, would have been okay, but it seems like the introduction of humans and disease to that population that they were unaware of decimated it. So even um, though we don't necessarily have good signs of things like disease from contact, we don't have signs of war warfare from humans uh, interacting with Neanderthals either. Disease is a very powerful weapon for taking new uh, territory. As most of you probably realize, most of the native populations of North America died before any settlers got here because of that initial contact. The disease just decimated the population. So it is very possible that there is a disease link in this, um, in this scenario. Ecology, and I did say I was gonna talk about ecology, is interesting. So could Neanderthals just not live in their new ecology? It warmed up. They got, they're no longer in their cold, barren plains. They have to live in the forest. Did that just do it for them? Well, the interesting thing is Neanderthals lived a long time in a lot of places, and they didn't always live in cold, desolate landscapes. They have lived in, in forests and done all right. And we can see that as it changed, we do have um, Neanderthals exploiting resources. And what we do see when you analyze it kind of across the range is that more plants are used um, during interglacial. So when it's warmer, plant, uh, the Neanderthals were using more plants. And they also use more plants than other Neanderthals when living in a forest, but not as much as the humans. So the humans are exploiting the environment better, but is that enough? Like how good do you have to be at exploiting your environment? Lots of things are not perfect for their environment, and they survived till now just fine. We still have koalas, right? So there's an idea that it's kind of held on that there can be, that there needs to only be one group of hominins left. There's no reason that has to be the case. For much of human history, there was more than one group. Um, it does not seem that in Europe, that there was um, food shortages that would have meant that the environment could only support one group of, of hominins. So there doesn't seem to be food shortages, and it doesn't seem like Neanderthals wouldn't be able to adapt to a changing faunal and um, vegetation. So if they're not inferior, why aren't they here? And the thing is, they kind of are here, and Scott talked about this. There is interbreeding between um, humans and Neanderthals, so we have one in 4% after 2,000 generations, which is quite, quite good. Um, this is my, mine, I'm 2.9, pretty pleased with that. Um, what's interesting about the types of genetics we get from Neanderthals is it's showing up in our immune systems and it's showing up in our UV adaptions, both of things that we would need to live in a new environment such as Europe. Okay, so this could easily have given us the select advantage we need to live in this environment, whether it was um, like how, how useful it was, I don't know. We do know that um, having a diverse and widely uh, varying immune system is the best thing you can have. The more things your immune system will catch, the better you are. So that's very, very interesting. So why do we have this idea, it lingers, that we're here, we must be superior. We don't like the bad luck hypothesis. So I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily um, under, answer the question of whether modern human behavior is the reason that Neanderthals 
weren't available to survive. They just didn't have the tools and the dietary diversity to live up to us. Um, but it's definitely more complex than it has been shown. So it's easy to say that we are superior when you think of Neanderthals as meat only, mammoth only um, animals. But when you start looking at the more complex um, picture, it gets a little bit uh, more uh, difficult to make those types of assumptions. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.